Hey, this is LOA Today, the Law of Attraction Show. Welcome to LOA Today. My name is Walt Thiessen. It is Monday, December 10, 2012. With me today is Bob Berg, the author of The Go-Giver, as well as his earlier work, Endless Referrals, and he's going to be sharing with us some of the insights that he shares both within uh, those books and from his uh, extensive career as a an author and speaker. Um, Bob's book, The Go-Giver, shot to number six on the Wall Street Journal's business bestsellers list just three weeks after its release and reached number nine on Business Week. It's been translated into, is this right, 21 languages? My goodness. And it is his fourth book to sell over 250,000 copies. Bob Berg, welcome to the program. Well, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Oh, glad to have you here. I mean, uh, somebody of your stature, it, whenever we get somebody like you on the show, that just takes the show up one more notch. So this is great. Well, oh, that's very <laughs> kind of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So let's go right to it. Uh, obviously, you've written a number of books over the years. And, uh, well, actually, before I even get into The Go-Giver, let, let's go back into your background a little bit. Um, okay. Just give us like a 60-second you know, summary of how your whole uh, speaking career started and, and how it evolved over time. Began as a broadcaster, sports, uh, radio sports, and then television news was not a very good newscaster, uh, so I soon wasn't a, a newscaster, and graduated into sales, knew nothing about sales, but learned through reading books and listening to CDs and meeting some great mentors, and um, began a career in sales, worked my way up to sales management, and then um, started sharing with others what was working for me. And that sort of morphed into a professional speaking career, and I've been doing that for, gosh, probably 25 years. And I'm curious, what were you selling when you uh, first started your your selling career? Well, I began by selling television and radio advertising. Uh huh. Yeah, and uh, sold a couple of other things, uh, and then most notably, and where I really kind of came into my own was uh, selling solar energy hot water units to homeowners. And, uh, again, this was, gosh, uh, almost 30 years ago. So you were well ahead of the green curve. Um, yeah, you know, I guess so. Back then there were there were great tax credits, uh, and I, um, you know, was able to, to really get in with a company that had a great product and, uh, you know, felt it really added value to people. And people who had the, the units really loved them, and so it always felt great to know that, that someone was finding value. Uh, in the product. But you found that uh, you had much more to give than just uh, helping people uh, greenify their homes and save energy. You actually were able to help them in a wide range of ways because of uh, what you discovered through your own experience and through what you read. Now, t tell us how that uh, whole evolution took place. Yeah, and by the way, I think back then there wasn't so much the green um, uh, uh, focus uh, because you know it, it, that wasn't really something back in the mid '80s that was that was really well that known about I guess uh, it was more the energy savings and that was of course you know always very big so right. uh, that was that was pretty much the um, you know that you could that they could save a lot of a lot of money on their energy and and utilize uh, the money they otherwise would have had to pay for taxes so. Um, the, but you know, really, the way it, it came about was I, I loved sales, loved studying sales, loved everything about it, really. And uh, when you study sales, you're studying people, you're studying humanity, and you learn a real lot. <laughs> <laughs> and in learning about sales, it's not so much just the the how tos, techniques, and so forth. Although that's certainly also very important, it's really understanding yourself. It's it's reading great books uh, such as Think and Grow Rich. It's reading great books such as How to Win Friends and Influence People, and and uh, you know the the psychology of winning and the and uh, 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 oh, I'm trying not to I'm thinking so many books right you know books right now that I love you know James <laughs> Allen as a man thinketh and uh, Psycho Cybernetics by Dr Maxwell Malt and the Magic of Thinking Big. Uh, by David Schwartz, and all these books have little to do with, you know, directly with sales, but they all have everything to do with sales because they have to do with you, they have to do with the energy you're putting out, they have to do with how your brain is working and understanding the the entire process. So it's it's really a 
uh, a wonderful education. Well, you know, you mentioned a whole bunch of books uh, that uh, influenced you, and I guess the question that would enter my mind is if I've read all these greats, I've read all this, this wonderful, wonderful input these people have provided over the years, and I was even beginning to contemplate the idea of writing my own book, the first question in my mind would be, well, why bother? What can I contribute that they haven't contributed already? And yet you had something that you had to contribute. What was that? I think that's a great question, yeah. and, I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you why I do. Um, it, it, because I've, I've had people who uh, who I've suggested that they they write books, and they tell me that you know that same thing. They've learned from all these other books, and that do they have anything new to say? And here's the thing: yes and no. I mean, I often like to say that I've never had an original thought in my life, <laughs> and I've never felt the need to because there's so many so many great thinkers who, who came before us, oh, sure. and yet all these thoughts help us to have our own thoughts. Mm. Uh, you know, we we all can learn from all these people, and yet we all implement them our own way, and we all have our own unique experiences. And so y y let's take something in, in sales that we often hear about, the alternate of choice, you know, where you give a person rather than a, a, asking a yes or no question, you give the choice between two yeses, whether they'd like to meet at 1030 or would one o'clock be more uh, convenient for them. And, and we know, you know, as, as uh, that it's we don't want to ask it in such a way that it's technique. Uh, we want to ask instead in such a way that it honors the other person and actually, you know, allows them to, to do what they would want to do. And so, so I, I know in one of my books, I talked about being asked by somebody when they called on the phone, who was trying to set an appointment. And that, and this is when I was talking about the alternative choice, which I was ha glad that I had learned early in my sales career. But when they asked me, it sounded so automatic and so rehearsed. Uh, the person right away, you know, said to me, well, what, do you want to meet at nine o'clock or is 10 o'clock better? You know? And I said, so when we ask that question, if we're focused on ourselves, it's going to come out as though we're focused on ourselves. Like we're just trying to set an appointment regardless of the other person. If we ask it with a focus on providing value to the other person, it's going to be communicated a lot more benevolently and a lot more effectively. How about, so, how about outside of sales though? Because uh, sales isn't the only kind of person that you're reaching. How does the same thing play out for somebody outside of sales? Well, look at how people and families use this when we, you know, with a child. Who you uh, again taking the same uh, alternative choice? How many parents now, rather than you know telling their kids to do something, give them a choice of two yeses? Uh -huh. You know, so so all these any any great concept, any any true principle can pretty much be used across the board. Uh, the, you know, the whole key is is focus. So so we've all. Uh, yeah, you know, and I know with you, where you do, do such a great job when it comes to the law of attraction. Well, hasn't a lot been written about the law of attraction? Absolutely, but has it been written from your viewpoint? Not, no, <laughs> and from your unique experiences. And these are things we can all learn from. So, so when people who I know just have a, a, a huge amount of knowledge and wisdom about something. Uh, have feelings about writing a book because they said, "Well, there's really nothing I can add." Sure, there is. You add yourself. And you add your experiences. You know, what you're describing uh, resonates with me in the sense that um, in my other job, <laughs> I, I have a business where I provide uh, website hosting design development services and so forth. And with my customers, uh, the, the thing that I'm always trying to get them to tell me about, especially when I'm trying to create a new website for them, is what's unique about your business. And that really mm -hmm. just fits in perfectly with what you're saying mm. Be because that's the key. That's the thing that uh, allows, you know, 500 dentists to all uh, uh, compete within the Washington, D.C. area. You know, do we need 500 dentists? Well, we could debate that all we want to, but the fact is 500 can fit in very nicely because each one of them has a slightly different take on how they provide their services. Exactly, exactly. Which is very cool. Now, uh, Endless Referrals was your first book. When did that come out? The first edition of that came out in 94. Uh, we since revised it uh, completely twice, once in 1999 and, and the last time in, in 2005. And that one did very, very well, uh, but it, it's almost been eclipsed by uh, The Go-Giver. And, and tell us the story about how The Go-Giver came about. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the book Endless Referrals was a, a how-to book, and – 
it, the basic premise of the book was that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust, and that the key to to cultivating these kinds of relationships is really to take the focus off of yourself and focus on providing value to other people. Uh, be, you know, when you first meet them, and all the way through to to when you are doing business with them directly and or uh, receiving referrals and introductions from them and so forth. And and uh, I had been reading a lot of parables from the time I got into sales. Really, I think the first one I read was uh, Ogmandino's The Greatest Salesman in the World. Mm, it's a great one. Wonderful book. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then there was Klassen's The Richest Man in Babylon. Wow. Mm-hmm. A great parable regarding financial planning. Uh, and then, you know, in the early 80s, there was Blanchard and Johnson's wonderful book, The One Minute Manager. And and that really began the real small kind of parable uh, formula. And then Johnson's One Minute Salesman or One Minute Salesperson, I think it was. And then, uh, you know, Robin Sharma wrote a great book, uh, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. My friend Chris Widener has written six or seven of them. And, and many people have written these business fables, business parables. And, you know, they're all great. And you can, <laughs> you can read them in an hour. You can learn a lot. And I think, you know, as you know, stories really connect with people. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to – to take the basic premise of endless referrals and put it into a parable. And, and I, I sort of had the title, go, The Go-Giver, and carried it in my, my head for a couple of years while I was deciding really what to do with it. And I you know, you know, mapped out a very brief, sketchy, very sketchy outline uh, with some very uh, surface character sketches uh, and finally began to write it. And I sat down and began to write it, and it took me all of about 30 seconds to realize that there's a big difference between writing a, a how-to book, uh, which Endless Referrals was, which is fairly easy. You simply put down what you know, and then you edit and fix it up later. Right. <laughs> and there's a big difference between that and writing a work of fiction, which is what, what The Go-Giver would be. And I, I realize, and this is not in any way false modesty. It's not, it's not having a lack of confidence in myself. Not at all. Uh, would it be stepping outside my comfort zone? Yes, and that I'm fine with. But what it would also be is stepping out what John, the, uh, Dr. John Maxwell calls stepping outside my strength zone. Mm, yeah. It was not something that is a strength of mine, and I knew that I, I could not put into this what it would take to make it the kind of book that I knew I wanted it to be and that it could be. And so I asked a, a friend of mine, John David Mann, who at that time I'd actually never met in person, uh, I think I'd only spoken with him once or twice, but he was the editor-in-chief of a magazine I used to write for. So uh, we used to go back and forth every month where I would I would submit the article. And, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, editors, while they're great, you know, you wonder, well, are they going to leave your best stuff out? Or are they going to this or that? So there's a little bit of defensiveness that I think naturally comes along with that. But John was so great, so brilliant. Uh, the running joke, and he's very humble, so he'd always he'd, he'd send back the finish, and he'd say, well, I edited this here, or I made a slight change here, or, is this okay, would you rather me put it back? And, uh, the running joke used to be that every month I'd send back a, an email that's a, that would say, John, not only is it great, you know, not only uh, is it terrific, but you write my stuff better than I write my stuff. <laughs> and and so I knew John, and I also knew John, because back then before John was as well known as he is now, and he is. I mean, you walk into a bookstore and there'll be three books that have made the bestseller list that that, has, that John was either co-author or ghostwriter for. Um, and a lot of people know who John is now. But back then, there were only the people kind of in the know knew that John was really the, the master writer behind a couple of books and just a brilliant man. And so I asked John if he would be the lead writer and storyteller for this. And he was already very, very busy, but he did take a look at it uh, and decided to, to, that it would be a good project. Thank goodness. I'm glad he did. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, that from, from there, it, uh, it was only a few months for us to, to write the book with John, of course, doing the lead part. And, uh, and then the, the biggest thing, though, was that we got turned down. Our agent got turned down by about 25 publishers. We revised a bunch of it, and then the next year – 
uh, she took it back out there, and it it uh, it got bought by uh, you know the Penguin Portfolio, who has been an amazing blessing. I've I've had several publishers; they've all been very nice, good people, but I've never had a publisher like this who was just such a team member and just really got behind a book and has just been been wonderful to work with. You know, you were talking about. Uh the art of storytelling, and it truly is an art that uh, you have to master if you want to be really good at it. And apparently mm-hmm. the co-author has been certainly a master of it because uh, he put together a book that was very effective, and the public have, have eaten it up, to say the least. Uh, but, yeah, that, that's a really very specialized art form. Not many people are really good at it. I, I know from experience because I tried writing one myself, and it is not easy. It, you're right. It's a lot harder than writing a nonfiction book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> oh, yeah, much harder. So let's go into the Go Giver a little bit. What is the Go Giver about? In other words, what what's the message? What's the parable? Well, it's really it's a story about a, a young, ambitious, up and coming uh, businessman named Joe, who's a nice guy and very well meaning. Works very hard. Very frustrated though, because despite how hard he's working, he doesn't seem to be getting anywhere fast or even slow. And he's he's at a point where he's about to miss quota again, and and he's worried about losing his job and feeling very desperate. That's definitely he, a position you know, he, a lot of people recognize for sure. I know mm-hmm. I recognize it from my life. I, I think we've all been Joe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. And um, and he meets a guy, he meets a mentor uh, who uh, who also introduces him to some other mentors, and along the way, Joe learns a very very basic lesson. Although there are five. There are five uh, laws or principles. The, the the basic premise is simply that shifting one's focus, and that's where the key is, the focus, shifting one's focus from getting to giving. And in this case, when we say giving, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing value to others. That doing so is not only a, a nice way to live life, but a very financially profitable way as well. And that really leads into what the very first uh, law is that's presented in the book, isn't it? Yeah, it's the foundational principle, the law of value, which which says that your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Now, the interesting thing about that is these most of these laws are very counterintuitive. They they sound at first like they wouldn't really work, and then they're kind of deeper than than what meets the eye. Uh, when we say that you know your your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment, the natural question is, well, you know that's fine, but how do you not go broke doing yeah. that? <laughs> right? How do you give more in value than you take in payment and, and not go out of business really quickly? So, for this, we simply need to understand the difference between price and value. Mm. Uh, price is a dollar figure; it's finite. It, it is what it is. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, this service, this concept, this opportunity, this idea that brings with it so much worth or value that someone would willingly exchange his money for it and be just ecstatic that he did while you make a very healthy profit? And as a a quick example… Uh, let's imagine you hire uh, an accountant to uh, to do your taxes, your tax return, and he charges you, and just to name a round figure, he charges you $1,000. That's his fee or his price. Uh, now, what does he give you in value in return for this $1,000 price? Well, he saves you $5,000 on your taxes. He saves you 25 hours of time, and he he provides you with the security and peace of mind of knowing it was done correctly. So we see here that value can be both concrete in terms of the $5,000 savings. It can also be intangible in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the both the time, but also the uh, peace of mind and security. And, and that, like the old, uh, I think it was a MasterCard commercial, that where they would say that's priceless. Right. That's probably worth more than the uh, the money. So, uh, so what he did is he gave you well over five thousand dollars in value or use value in exchange for the thousand dollar price. 
So you come away with it just feeling great because you got much more value than what you paid for. And he also made a very, very healthy profit, which he should uh, based on that, that exchange. Now, this is the kind of relationship we want to have with anyone with whom we do business. We want to give them so much more in value than we take in payment, whether it's the product itself, whether it's the, the unique buying experience, whether it's the, whatever the feelings are that this person wants from this exchange. We want to give them such a, an immensely positive buying experience that they feel that what they received is worth much more than what they paid for it while we make a very healthy profit. And this, again, goes back to focus. And that really means that the focus is on the customer, not on yourself. It's on providing value, not on your commission. Because here's the thing. When you're in a presentation, if you're focused on the money, they know it. <laughs> At some level, they can tell. And they're much less likely to trust you, to respect you, and, and, and trust your judgment. On the other hand, if they can tell that you are totally, unabridgedly, and unabashedly focused on providing value to them, they're going to be much more likely to feel good about you, trust you, respect you, and exchange their money for the value you're offering. And this is why we say that money is simply an echo of value. It's the thunder to values lightning, which means, again, nothing more than that the, the value comes first and the money is simply a natural and direct um, effect of the value that's been provided. And if we think about it, really, it is a direct reflection of what anyone who buys something is expecting. Because mm -hmm. anyone who, who buys something, they're looking to get the most value for their buck, the most bang for their buck. So it, it ties in directly with what a customer would want. And when you look at it that way, when you understand things that way, all of a sudden trying to have the lowest price doesn't seem to be as important anymore. Um, well, right, exactly. In fact, when you when you try to make your unique selling proposition low price, it, it really doesn't. Unless you're Walmart, you know, which most of us aren't, <laughs> it's not going to work out because when they buy on on price, they're just buying a commodity, and so to them, it's nothing more than a commodity, and they're going to stay with you only until someone can beat your price or or communicate that their value is is worth so much more than that price. This is why I often say that when you sell on low price, when you sell on price, you're a commodity. When you sell on value, you're a resource. And outside yeah. the world of, of, of buying and selling, when, when we look at the world of general human inner dynamics, human dynamics as a, a, as a non-economic activity, we mm -hmm. see the same thing, don't we? It's the same pattern. People who uh, have the most happy relationships, who have the best friends and so forth, are the ones who tend to try to give more value than they're getting back in return. Exactly, and uh, and that really is it in a, in a nutshell. Those who focus on providing value to others, which simply means you're focusing on that other person, um, not on yourself. You're going from what we call an I focus or a me focus to an other focus. That's the person who accomplishes the most and has the best relationships, both uh, financial and personal. Now, of course, people who go to work, who take a job, who start a business, who go into a sales career or any other kind of career, they are looking to be compensated. So how does this concept of value actually tie into their compensation? Sure. And, and that's where the next law comes in, the law of compensation, which says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment while still making a profit, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives we add this kind of exceptional value to, the more money with which we'll be rewarded. Uh, if you take your accountant in the first example, he did a great job of giving more in value than he took in payment. So as a result, you, are, you were very happy with him. You would do business with him again, and you would most likely refer him to many others. Uh, well, his other clients feel the same way about him, so our accountant is very quickly amassing what we call an army of personal walking ambassadors. And as he continues to add that kind of exceptional value to the lives of more and more people, his income will continue to grow and grow. And it's the same for anyone and everyone, whether that person is an accountant, a banker, a chiropractor, an electrician, a dentist, whether they're a financial advisor, whether they sell graphic design. 
it, the the first law, the law of value, is very very important. Um, but as um, Nicole Martin, one of the mentors in the story, tells Joe, the main protege, uh, that that first law, the law of value, um, what that really is 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 that's about your potential income. That represents your potential income, but it's not enough to just provide that great value to one person. Uh, compensation is also a matter of outreach. It's a matter of of touching the lives with with uh, with that value to a lot of people. It's the impact you make with many. So we can almost sum up the first two laws by saying that exceptional value plus significant reach equals very high compensation. If we were talking about somebody who's an entrepreneur or, or a small business owner, we'd be talking about how to scale the business. That's basically the same concept, isn't it? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, you started to touch on the fact that uh, somebody who uh, engages both the law of value and the law of compensation by trying to reach out to more and more people, obviously they're um, the, the more people that they're serving, the more they scale their business, um, the more they become a part of that community, whatever that community might be, um, the, the greater their influence becomes, the greater their reach becomes. And uh, I think I just said what the third law is. So how does that tie into the third law? Yeah, the third law is the law of influence. And, and this one says that your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, again, this one sounds counterintuitive. It sounds downright counterproductive at best and perhaps uh, a bit Pollyanna-ish <laughs> at worst, right? Uh, and yet this is how putting other people's interests first is how the great leaders, the great influencers, the over-the-top successful producers, this is how they, they run their lives and conduct their businesses. They um, – well, first, let me qualify something because this is very important. When we say place other people's interests first, we do not mean that you should be anybody's doormat, uh, a martyr, or self-sacrificial in any way, shape, or form. Not at all. It's simply, uh, as as Sam and um, Ernesto told Joe in the story, Sam and Ernesto were a couple of the other mentors. Joe, uh, again, is the, the main protege. And as they, they told Joe the basic, the, the foundational law of, uh, of business, of sales, of networking, what have you, is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective uh, method of eliciting those, those feelings toward you from others than by, again, stepping outside your own concerns, uh, what we call temporarily suspending your self-interest. That, that phrase was actually coined by uh, Thomas Powers from the United Kingdom who, who wrote Networking for Life. Uh, and I, I love that phrase, Tempora not temporarily suspend, not foregoing, but temporarily suspending your self-interest. Again, moving from an I focus to an other focus. Asking yourself, how can I make this person's life easier, better, more successful, happier, whatever it is that, that you bring to the table with the value that you provide. And again, this begins right from when you meet this person before business is ever even brought up. And, and it goes all the way through the relationship for the, the remainder of it and such. Uh, and the people who do this are really the people who create these strong relationships. They're planting seeds of goodwill, seeds of great will all over, and they're attracting other people to them who, who like they do. They, they, these people understand that the, the best business – all relationships, but in this case, in the context of business, the best relationships are not 50-50. They're simply 100 with everyone just just focusing on how they can provide value to the others and you, as you can imagine the only thing stronger than two people having this type of relationship is an entire network of people having this kind of relationship imagine how much value gets passed around and added to people's lives and while doing this the great influencer understands that they need to do this without emotional attachment to the results. 
Now, some people say, well, in other words, you mean give without expecting anything in return. And, and I take a little bit of issue with that. Now, I know what they mean. I know what they mean. I think what they mean is without attachment because I always expect good things to happen. Why would we not? <laughs> you know? um, so, yeah, let, let's expect great things to happen, but let's not be attached to their having to happen or the form, the particular form of their happening. And you use two words in there that, of course, are very close to what the, the nominal theme of this show is, law of attraction, one being attract and the other one attach. Uh, a, a, a attraction, of course, uh, is an important theme, and it's important in this case in part because when we're talking about law of attraction, most people, not most people, a lot of people think of it as just an esoteric abstract concept and that all you're supposed to do is just think about something and you attract it, which is possible to do, but really that's not what the whole concept is about. The concept is about putting your mind, your focus in the right place and then taking steps in that direction. And that's the part that I was noticing about what you were saying about attracting. It wasn't enough to attract. You also had to go out there and find. It was a combination. Sure. And, you know, that's why people often say with the title of the book being the go-giver, they say, oh, so you're saying you don't really have to be a go-getter. No, that's not what we're saying at all. We say be a go-getter and a go-giver. Mm -hmm. See, a go-getter is someone who takes action. A go-getter is someone who, who knows that, that thoughts are great. Of course, thoughts are things. They have their own energy, you know, to them. And thoughts are wonderful. They're the starting place. Uh, and yet, you know, you could have the greatest thoughts in the world, the best intention in the world, but without action being part of the mix, well, not nothing is going to happen. And so a go-getter is somebody who says, hey, you know, I need to take action for this to happen. Now, uh, there's, no, there's no natural dichotomy or struggle or difference between a go-getter and a go-giver. Many go-getters are also go-givers, and all go-givers – are also go-getters. The opposite of a go-giver, then, is not a go-getter. The opposite of a go-giver is a go-taker. That's the person who feels almost entitled, if you will, to take, 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 without having added value to the person, to the process, to the situation. So what, you know, what we say is be both a go-getter and a go-giver, just don't be a go-taker. I guess you could say, then, that a go-giver is somebody who – goes to get someone to give to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a good way to see it. <laughs> and then on the other uh, point, the, the word attachment, that's a word that more and more people in the LOA circles have been using to describe the fact that if you become attached to something mm -hmm. in, in an obsessive kind of way, you actually prevent whatever change you're looking for from happening just because your attention keeps getting drawn back to the attachment and you lose yeah. focus on the thing that you're trying to attract. Well, yeah, in a great book I read many years ago, which I've, I've you know always used as a guide, and and, uh, and which I think was just brilliant. Uh, it was called The Handbook to Higher Consciousness by Ken Kai's uh, Senior, and he he actually referred to attachments as addictions, mm. which I thought was very interesting uh, because he said you know when you're addicted to a result. Uh, if you, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, you can desire a result or, or you can prefer a result, that's fine. <laughs> but when you're, when you're what we would call attached, what he called addicted to the result, like any addiction, what happens is even if you get it, you're still sad because you're anxious and you're scared and you're living in fear of losing that which you're addicted to, which you got. And, of course, if you don't get it, then you're in pain, you're in anger, you're in sadness because you didn't get it. And he said, so when you prefer something, hey, if you get it, great. You know, that's what you prefer. If you don't get it, that's okay too. And, and again, that's how I see attachment. Uh, in sales, I, I, when, I, when I speak at, at sales seminars, I'll say, uh, you know, what you want, what you want is to, to care but not that much, <laughs> you know. You, if you're, you're speaking to a prospect, you know, do you want them to? Do you prefer that they buy from you? Sure, you prefer it, and if they buy, great. If they don't, that's okay. You're, you're, you prefer it, but you're not attached to it. Uh, you're not emotionally attached to the result. So again, when you're and, and when you're not, you you can be more effective because it, when you're attached to something or addicted to it, people can tell. 
so people don't feel as comfortable with you. So yes, exactly. Uh, by being in a state of preference rather than attachment or addiction, the chances are actually much better you're going to get what you prefer anyway. I love the use of that word addiction in this case. Uh, I, I think it's really very, very appropriate because among other things, it helps helps make clear perhaps for people who uh, have struggled with the concept of LOA, um, not necessarily in sales, although certainly it applies there too, but just in general in, in, in their everyday lives because it, if you understand that uh, an attachment is very much the same thing as an addiction, it becomes easier to understand why um, other attempts to attract things that are not necessarily directly related to whatever it is you're attached to mm -hmm. fail. You're, 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 you're drawn back to the wrong thing, and so all your efforts fall apart. Boy, does that really make it clear for somebody who's having trouble? Yes. Now, the fourth law, authenticity. How does that tie in? What exactly is it? Yeah, the law of authenticity says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. Uh, in the story, one of the other, one of the mentors, Deborah Davenport, she had learned a very important lesson, and that is that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, even people skills, as important as they are, and indeed they are very important, they're all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core, if you don't show up as yourself. But when you do, when you do show up as yourself, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you know, people feel good about you. People feel comfortable with you. They know you. They like you. They trust you. Um, they, uh, people in general have a, a need for consistency. Uh, this probably goes back to the cave person days when you needed to know that the same danger one day was the same danger the next day mm -hmm. and that all the signs were consistent. To, you know, But whatever the reason, we, we still have that to this day. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think people have really gotten better at, at sort of being able to snuff out when someone really is not authentic, when someone's not really being themselves. And I think this I think with people not really being authentic, you've got two types. Uh, you know, one is the type that really is a phonus balonus. You know, they really are the type that are they're trying to pull one over on. And, hey, and you know what? Some people are really good at it, and they get away with it uh, for a while. They do. But, but you know, but that's relatively few people. Uh, you know, the the ones that I'm talking about here really are. The people who I think in a sense just don't have the self-confidence to realize that they are enough as they are. Uh, they don't realize that they bring value to the table, that people, whether it's the marketplace or social life or whatever, that people will, will be attracted to. Uh, I, you know, I, I really believe that we have two types of, of value. One is intrinsic value. Just by being born, we, we bring uh, value to the table. But there's also what I call market value. Now, this could be in the marketplace of business, but it could also be in the marketplace of social. It could be in the marketplace of, uh, of many areas of life. But what I mean by this is that we all have strengths, and we all have weaknesses, of course. Sure. Uh, but our strengths we often don't recognize. And one reason we don't recognize it is because we're just too close to the situation. We're too emotional about it. We, we know ourselves, but, but through knowing ourselves so well, sometimes we don't know ourselves you know, as, as well as we think, at least not objectively. Uh, let's say you have a particular skill, uh, and, and maybe this is a natural skill, or maybe you put in that 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, as Malcolm Gladwell talked about in, in Outliers, and Jeffrey Colvin talked about in, in his book, Talent is Overrated. But for whatever reason, whether it's natural or you've put in the, the time and, and hours into it, you have a great skill. Well, here's the thing. Once you have this for a while, you get so used to it, you don't realize how special it is. Mm -hmm. And I know I've mentored people, and I'm sure you've done the same thing, where they've, they've said something or done something, and, and I know I've said to them, wow, that is, that is absolutely brilliant. That's fantastic. And their response was, oh, no, no, everybody knows that, or everybody <laughs> does that. Well, I've done no. that one myself. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think we've all done that. And not everybody knows it, but here's the thing, and that's why I think it's so important to to either have a, a coach or have a mentor or or someone 
um, who knows you well but is emotionally far enough away that, you know, that they can see clearly that they can see from a distance a little bit, a little bit detached, if you will, uh, uh, positively detached, uh, so that they can help you to see in the story Deborah Davenport learned by default at the very last minute <laughs> the, the, the value, the strength that she really uh, had to offer, that authentic strength. There's no reason why it has to happen by accident. In fact, I, I, you know, I'll say it shouldn't happen by accident. We need to, to seek out that understanding, whether it's through introspection, through reading books, or best by having someone we can work with who can help us identify that strength. Uh, now, when we say you, know, you are enough, that is true, but that also doesn't mean we don't continue to learn and improve ourselves. So, you know, that's why we continue to read books and listen to CDs and go to seminars and, to, you know, training and, and, and watching and learning and listening. Um, the, the great news is, we, you know, and the, the sages of old asked, uh, you know, who is a wise person? And their answer was that person who learns from all others. And that's a neat thing. We can learn from all others, whether it's through books. Now, some of my greatest mentors, uh, you know, people like Benjamin Franklin – uh, Booker T. Washington, uh, you know uh, these people who I, I, Abraham Lincoln, who I read on these people all the time. These are my, these are mentors of mine. I've never met them, of course, but these are mentors of mine, as well as the mentors that I read today and, and get to chat with today. People like Gandhi Scumachi and Randy Gage, and and you know different people who I get to learn from in mastermind groups, and so we can learn from all others. Now, here's the thing. And I think this is what's so important and, and has to do with authenticity. While we can learn from everyone, we need to make sure not to try to be those people. In other words, adapt their wisdom, but don't try to adopt their personality because that's not going to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can only be the best you that you can be. So that's why, you know, so, so learn from them, utilize their wisdom into your life, but adapt. Don't adopt. Adop, adapt their wisdom, but don't try to, to adopt their personalities and be them. Stay true to your authentic core. You know, the, the five concepts, the five main concepts that you put forth in the book, uh, you turn them laws. The, the fourth one, the authenticity one, that strikes me as being both the most important one and the most elusive for many people, I would think. And I, I think part of the problem is – because of, of various issues people have with their own self-confidence and so on and so forth, we aren't really experienced at looking at our own authenticity. So if you can, just off the top of your head, what's the best way to know for yourself when you're being authentic? Well, I think, and, and I think this would, would tie a little bit into to, uh, the law of attraction that, that you teach. Uh, and I would think, and again, I'm not, I'm certainly by no means an expert in law of attraction. So, Well, you're doing uh, very I, well. <laughs> I, uh, well, thank you. But I would assume that if you're feeling good about yourself, you're probably being authentic with yourself. Right. If you're feeling badly <laughs> and the vibes are kind of low, uh, there's probably a chance that things aren't quite where you need them to be in that, in that area. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's that's the nutshell, the the nub of, of where you start from when you're trying to deliberately attract rather than attract by default like we normally do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and that, of course, leads us into the last principle or the, or the last law, as you term it, the law of receptivity. Mm -hmm. And I have a suspicion I know where this goes, but why don't you tell us? Sure. The law of receptivity says that the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. Uh, yeah, late in the story, the main mentor, Pindar, asks his protege, Joe, to breathe out and hold that breath to the count of 30. Joe tries, but in a very short period of time, he's gasping for air, struggling to breathe. And Pindar says, what's the matter? Joe can't do it. And Joe says, no, I, can, I can't just breathe out. And I've got to breathe in, too. And, and Pindar said, and, and he jokingly asked, well, Joe, what if I was to – to uh, tell you that it's been actually been medically proven that it's healthier to breathe out than it is to breathe in. <laughs> and Joe will laugh just like you did. He said, well, that's, that's silly. You know, you, you can't just breathe out. You've got to breathe in as well. Well, absolutely. Of course you do. We breathe out and we breathe in. 
Uh, we breathe out carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving. We breathe in, which is receiving. Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work best in tandem. Um, actually, to focus on just one side of that equation while trying to minimize the other is really an, an exercise in futility first because every giving is made possible because it's also a receiving, and every receiving is made possible because it's also a giving. But also when you refuse to accept the gifts of others, uh, when you refuse to receive from others, you're shutting down the flow. There's a natural back and forth, an in and out. The tide goes out, it comes back in. It's not an either or. And to try to make it that way is very counterproductive for everyone. All the giving in the world, and, and again, when we speak of giving in this vernacular, we're talking about providing value to others. All the giving in the world is, is great. It's terrific. But it's all for naught if you're not willing to allow yourself to receive in like measure. Mm -hmm. So the key isn't do you give or receive. No, you do both. It's where the focus is. Focus on the giving part. Focus on the giving and allow the receiving. And then there's a, 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 I guess it's a sixth law. It's not really one of the main five laws, but it's termed a sixth law, the law of left field. What on earth is the law of left field? Is this like a baseball game? <laughs> kind of. Um, actually, it, it, it really isn't its own separate law. It's a, it's a mini law or sub law. Uh, within the fifth law of receptivity. And the, the, the law of left field uh, simply says that the, uh, the most uh, – um, uh, I just lost my train of thought for a second. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. The, the most valuable gifts will come at moments and from places you least expect. That's the law of left field. But how does that really work? Well, when, when living our lives and conducting business according to these principles, all sorts of value showers down upon us from that kind of unnoticed, unseen place. Uh, examples, you find a, a, a critical lead, you receive a great referral, you make a, a crucial last minute connection that, that results in a really lucrative new customer. Uh, a golden opportunity drops suddenly right into your lap, or some uh, incalculably valuable thing comes your way, but not from the people or places you might have expected or even hoped. So that's where we say, you know, you might say to yourself, wow, that one came right out of left field. field. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. When, when living – when, when living our lives, when conducting our lives with a giving spirit, I guess you could say when living with a giving spirit, focused on creating value for others, great value comes to you suddenly and unexpectedly and in amounts far greater than what anyone owes you. But, but here's the key, and this is very, very important, and this is what you were alluding to earlier, really. There's, there's absolutely nothing mystical or magical about this. You can't know exactly where these gifts will come from only because you can't know exactly where your influence is spread, but spread it has. You've planted so many seeds of goodwill, of great will. You know, so many people know you, like you, trust you, want to see you succeed, want to be a part of your life, that the world has now become what we call a benevolent context for success. And while you can't necessarily see its operation, there is indeed cause and effect. The cause is giving the effect receiving. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, in fact, also, that I was thinking in a number of different ways how what you were describing is what, in essence, is LOA, the law of attraction, because the whole concept is that whatever we think about is what we end up drawing to ourselves. We have so many thoughts we can't possibly keep track of them all. And because of that, things can come out of left field seemingly, even though we really did have a, a thought pattern that led us there. But, uh, hey, I can't even remember what I thought about five minutes ago, let alone five weeks ago. Right. Well, that's why we say that in the end, you know, it seems like it, 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 it came out of nowhere. But in reality, it, it came out of everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of describing it, too. It came out of everywhere. Um, now, the go-giver has been 
extraordinarily successful for you. And in fact, I believe it led to a sequel, didn't it? Well, yeah. Well, two different books. The the, the direct follow up book was called Go Givers Sell More, and that's where we actually. Um, made it a, a bit more how-to-ish. Uh, so where the go-giver was a story, go-givers sell more was the practical application of the five laws. Uh, but then we actually did have a sequel to it called It's Not About You, which takes the third law, the law of influence, and and we wrote, and again, uh, John did the real heavy lifting and, and great writing with this. Uh, it was the uh, it was a story based on the law um, of influence. Okay. So it was a it was another parable. So um, the 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 one that immediately came after the go givers was sort of a non fiction non fiction rather uh, right carry yeah. on of it. Yeah, and what we did with that is is we really went into detail regarding the laws, how they're used, and how people in businesses have used the various laws. Uh, but also included a lot of stories from people who would write us after the go giver came out to tell us how they utilize the laws uh, in, order to, um, in order to really increase their business. And we always, you know, we loved getting those. Those were, or were always a pleasure to get, whether it was from a, a huge leadership group or whether it was from an individual entrepreneur or whether it was someone who was just working for someone else. And they, they came to realize that, that really uh, they were still in sales because they were selling their time. They were selling their skills. They were selling their value. And even if they're a, a wage employee, it didn't matter. The key was to give more in value than what they took in payment, and as they did that, they climbed. And, you know, they either made themselves too valuable for that position, so they got advanced, or they ended up working for someone else at a higher pay, or they went into business for themselves. So so we really just love getting those, uh, you know, emails. And nowadays, of course, with email, it's so, it's so much easier. So... Um, you know that that's always a, a thrill. So, and we and we ended up using some of those stories in in Go Givers Sell More. Just a curiosity, how many of these uh, little notes, emails, things in the mail, and so forth have you received uh, since the Go Giver came out, telling about how X Y Z happened? Oh my goodness! You know something? It would be difficult to even even come up with a number. And, I, and I've saved a lot of them, of course, because you know it's so easy to file them. But uh, and some I haven't. Some I've actually printed out because I've just you know we're, we're so so grateful for them. But I don't. It would have to be hundreds and hundreds. I mean, we this is just uh, it's been a real thrill to to know that the book is has had this kind of effect. Yeah, that must be really gratifying uh, yeah. on a couple yeah. levels. Not only because it's directly gratifying, but it uh, reaffirms. Uh, uh, law number five. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Which is really quite cool. I mean, uh, the, the whole experience of writing this is actually a mirror of what you write about. It's, uh, it it is. Well, as a matter of fact, and, and it's funny because we talk about the no like and trust with with law three of influence. You know, well, John, you know, tells a story that that when I first asked him if he'd be interested in writing this this uh, story with me, he was swamped at the time. I mean, he had so many projects going, and he he said to his fiance Anna, and now his wife Anna, but at that time his fiance, he said, you know, I really don't even have time to look at this, but it's Bob. You know, I mean, how can I at least not take a? How can I not at least take a look? And so it was re because of the no like and trust relationship we had. That he even took a look at the script, and you know he was impressed enough by, by it by the the basic treatment, and he saw the potential in it. So yeah, everything about this, you know, plus in the way that we we met our agents and the, the everything that happened with this book has basically been a reflection of the five laws, which I, makes sense. You know, it's how we live our lives. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so what's next on your horizon? I mean, you've written four books now. They've all been very, very successful, and they've influenced, I think it's fair to say, millions of people. What's next? What, what's next on the Bob Berg agenda? Well, I have a book coming out, another book coming out um, in, um, in October of 2013. We don't have the title for it right now. We're still playing around with a few different titles. It will basically be on, on influence. It will be a how-to book. Uh, be on influence and, and what we call positive persuasion, and um, and uh, very excited about about this. We've got the first draft done, and and uh, and hopefully the publisher will like it, and we'll go on to the editing phase. Now, is there going to be a tour along with this, or are your touring days done? 
Uh, no, there probably will be, uh, just because it's so important when a new book comes out, uh, you know, that you get the word out there. And, and you know, while I do a lot of interviews, uh, it's also important to, you know, to, to be at the places too. So uh, just depending upon what we're doing and how we can schedule time and, and so forth, we'll, we'll probably put somewhat of a tour together. Well, one thing I'm curious about, because I'm sure you've done quite a few of them with all these successful books, how much do you tie – tours and so forth into, say, just plain travel, traveling for pleasure and, and entertainment? Um, actually, I don't travel for pleasure because I don't find travel particularly pleasing. Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. No, I, I made no, a, a false assumption. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm much more of a homebody, but I travel all the time for work because I speak. Right. So, right. yeah, so what I do is is what we try to do is we, we try to set up what we call anchor dates, which are, are you know, full fee paid corporate uh, engagements. And then what I'll do is I'll schedule other things, promotional things around that in the same basic geographic area. So what what do you do for enjoyment and entertainment? What's your favorite uh, hobby or, or what have you? Uh, I love to read. Um, but really, uh, you know, there's there's not – I don't really have hobbies and things like that. I always – you know, Joe, I always say to people, I'm probably the most boring person you've ever met, <laughs> and yet I find my life absolutely fascinating. So it's, it's you know, it, it kind of works out for me. That's very cool, though. <laughs> and the, the best part, though, the coolest part, so to speak, is that uh, you know yourself real well. And that's ultimately what we're all trying to achieve throughout our life. Uh, You've gotten you. there. That's really great. So, Well, Bob Bird, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Um, before we uh, sign off today, is there anything more you want to share? One, maybe, maybe one last tidbit that uh, people should keep in mind? Oh, I think it's it's great just to keep learning and just keep looking at ways you can provide value uh, to others, and you know that's always a uh, a great direction to go in for anybody who would like to visit my website. It's simply berg b u r g dot com, and while they're there, they can download chapter one of several of my books, uh, check out my uh, blog, and uh, connect with me on all the different social media that they would like. So come to Berg.com and, and uh, hang out and visit. Meanwhile, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate being on your show. You're a, a great host, and I know you're doing some terrific work. So uh, keep up the great work. Well, thank you, and thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Bob Berg, ladies and gentlemen, a, a real treat to, to talk with you today. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.